So now, let's uh, let, let's let's uh, in your minds, let's uh, let's have uh, Yvonne safely tucked away at Mingus Mountain on top of the on top of the mountain in Arizona, <laughs> right? And uh, and she's okay for right now. But now we've got a slightly different situation, and and this uh, this has to do with a, a young woman who um, who we're going to call uh, Keisha. And Keisha has come to um, her school-based health clinic for an STD test. STD, for those of you who don't know what that means, is sexually transmitted diseases. And so she's come to see you, Dr. Mays. What do you see? What do you hear? Okay, I, um, I just want to take one minute and just sort of give a, um, say something about Yvonne's case. Um, because in, in juvenile justice. And I think that one thing that we don't think so much about the medical community and how we interact with CSEC. Um, but we do know that CSEC youth access medical services more than, than other youth, more than even other high-risk youth who are not CSEC. And in juvenile hall, there is a medical clinic in juvenile hall that all youth are seen um, in the medical clinic within 48 hours of being um, booked into juvenile hall. And so it's a really great access point for the medical community to really support CSEC and even screen for CSEC and work with the other agencies in juvenile hall to um, support and treat CSEC youth. So that's about Yvonne. Now going to our next um, scenario, what's her name? Keisha. Keisha, okay. So with Keisha, um, we also know that in our county, in Alameda County, and in Oakland, in Oakland specifically, that over half of youth who are self-reported as CSEC do attend an Oakland Unified School District public school. Um, and we also have school-based health centers in most of our middle schools and high schools in Oakland. Um, and so it's a really great to have medical services that are um, confidential in the school. And so when we have a youth coming in for an STD test, um, all of our youth who come into our school-based health centers at Native fill out something called a teen screen, which is uh, basically looking at risk factors that the medical provider can talk to the youth about based on how they answer questions. Um, and so they would, they would fill out this teen screen as part of their um, just, just coming into services. So she says, uh, yeah, I think I have this STD, but no, I'm, I'm not being sexually exploited. What are the, what are the, what are the things, the, the little markers that tell you, well, maybe, maybe that's not accurate? So as part of our teen screen, we, add, we ask a question around sexual exploitation. We've added that to our screen. Uh, we adapted our screening question from Asian Health Services. They've been screening youth in their teen clinic for years. Um, and so the, teen, the question is something like, over the years, we've seen youth turning to the streets to exchange uh, sex for money, drugs, or other favors. Do you or a friend, have you or a friend been involved in something like this? Question something like that. They answer yes or no. If they answer no, and they have risk factors, so risk factors that we know are deeply connected with um, sexual exploitation or being at risk of exploitation, um, like coming into the medical clinic for multiple STD testing within the year, having multiple positive STDs within that year, uh, having friends or family who are known CSEC, history of being in juvenile hall, history of uh, running away, history of being in foster care. Those are some of the risk factors that we have listed on our, our questionnaire that we verbally screen them. So they answer no to the question in our school-based health centers. The provider, the medical provider on that day will, will verbally screen them, meaning when they're seen in the clinic, will say the same question that they answered on the written screen, we'll actually talk to them about that and, and see if they are ready to disclose or just have a conversation around it. So if you were having that conversation with Keisha, how might it go? So what I would do with Keisha, who came in for an STD test, who has, let's say she has multiple risk factors. She's run away from home. She's in and out of school. She doesn't come to school very much. And this is the fifth time that she's come in for an STD test. Um, and she answers no to the written screen. I would say, um, I, would, I would just broach that question, really. I would say, you know, we've, over the years, we've seen that there are that some youth um, go to the streets and they exchange money, uh, sex for money or drugs or other favors. Um, I, I'm concerned. Um, you've come in for several STD tests 
over the past year. Uh, I'm not saying that I think this is something that you're doing, but we know that this is something that happens and that youth um, can be, um, I wouldn't say coerced, I would say um, maybe I would say they are being forced to do this against their will or something like that. Um, is this something that um, is going on with you? Because I'm concerned. And she says. And she says no. <laughs> no, not me. no, I'm just here to be tested. Uh -huh. I'm just here to be. I, I just want to make sure everything is okay. So you just kind of let it go at that point. So I would say, okay, well, you. This is March, and this is your fifth time coming in. Um, why? Why is it that you want? Why is it that you want to be tested again? And so, uh, and so she's. So you're going back and forth with her. She's kind of denying it. Um, and at some point, she says, "Well, yeah." I used to do that, but I don't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, I guess I'd have, to, I'd have to back up a little bit because I'd have to talk about confidentiality. Um, so before we get into any sensitive conversations in our clinic, we always talk about confidentiality and what the limits are for confidentiality. So what I normally say is, every, you're here in the health center, this is completely private, which means that we don't talk to your friends or your family or, t or your teachers about what we talk about here in this room unless you tell me that you're going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else or if someone is hurting you. If that's happening, then that's something that I, ha I would have to tell someone else. So before we even have a discussion around, usually I say that at the beginning of the conversation because with youth, you never know when something is going to be disclosed that you actually have to talk to someone else about. Um, so after having that conversation, if she were to say that, yes, um, I, someone's forcing me, I'm, I'm having sex with people for money, or, um, or she's done that in the past, um, then we would, sort of, we would go into our, the protocol that we've set up at our health center, where I would tell her that I would have to um, involve, I would have to make a CPS report on that day. I don't have to leave the room right away and, and make the report, but I would let her know that that's something that's, that would be the process. So you call the hotline? So we should call the hotline, call yes. Call the hotline, you make a report. Michelle, so she's calling the hotline and, uh, and making a report. Uh, what happens then? Depends on the information she gives and how much detail there is to it. Um, we respond to abuse in the home or your caretaker, so we would need to know who who was exploiting her, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it would depend on the information that she has gathered from Keisha. Well, suppose it turns out not to be in the home. Suppose it turns out to be her, what we're calling her pimp, what she may be referring to as her boyfriend or her, her buddy. So then we would want to know what's happening at home. Um, it's easy to assume that the caregiver at home is doing nothing to keep their child from being exploited. Um, and so then we want to find out. What's happening in the home? Is there a caregiver that is trying to protect this child and is just not succeeding? So if it's not the caregiver, does it then pass out of the jurisdiction of child welfare? If the caregiver isn't being protective, it does. Yeah. Yeah. But, but she's not living with her caregiver. She's living with her boyfriend. But was the caregiver <laughs> trying to protect her? I mean, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. It's easy back and forth. Is she at home? Is she with the boyfriend? But the mother has been plastering the street with signs looking for her, yeah. right? There's yeah. other, oh, yeah. then we might be point. giving yeah. the mother support. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy to say she's living with the boyfriend. Yeah. But sometimes parents are actively looking and trying to pull their children out of this life. So, so Justice Bridge in Seattle, um, <laughs> you're faced with a similar situation. Is there a, what's the, what's the protocol? We are, our statute is exactly the same. Third party um, abusers are not, um, considered a trigger for um, child welfare intervention. But that said, um, the, uh, the, the trigger for a community, a, a community advocate uh, and, uh, can be triggered by any of the folks who uh, come into contact with a suspected CSEC, and that means anybody. So that's why training, somebody alluded to that a minute ago, that's why training and identification is so important for sort of not the usual suspects like the medical community, like teachers in school who can see these, uh, these things, because then they can trigger um, a, a community advocate who, again, can review the situation, and if it, it, if it appears as, uh, as if it were, would be helpful, 
and is necessary for safety reasons or a whole group of factors which are taken into consideration at the time can convene a, a, a multidisciplinary team around this child and try to figure out what kind of placement uh, would be available. Is, is there Phil family looking for her? Child welfare voluntarily pro, um, uh, would appear uh, at, the, at that multidisciplinary team because they have signed a multi, um, an MOU that in King County they will do this. They have not agreed to do this on a statewide basis yet, and this is, by, this is kind of by virtue of a, of a pilot uh, in Seattle. So we would have child welfare at the table. So, Leslie, this may be a question of child, uh, child abuse, or it may not. It may be a question of criminal activity, but it may not. There may be a parent involved or a care, but it may not. So how do you work this out from the perspective of the, of the attorney who's representing that child? Uh, before I answer that, I'm just going to read something really quickly, which is Welfare and Institutions Code Section 300.2, which says the purpose, and it's not, yeah, I have it on my phone. Um, the purpose oh, speed of the, dial, isn't it? The purpose of the provisions of this chapter relating to dependent children is to maximum safety and protection for children who are currently being physically, sexually, or emotionally abused, being neglected, or being exploited. Um, and to ensure the safety, protection, and physical and emotional well-being of children who are at risk of that harm. So from where we sit, there's no question about whether or not this child needs protection and whether or not the child welfare system um, should provide that protection. However, <laughs> thank you, Justice Bridge. That's why she's the justice and I'm the lawyer. Um, however, the... The, the child welfare system hasn't quite embraced that notion yet. Um, and, and I, what we would say, should, should we have the opportunity? And we won't have the opportunity to even say anything on behalf of the child if child welfare says, you're not being exploited in your home, so thank you very much. Best of luck to you. Here's a referral to a shelter. Here's a referral to a counseling center. Maybe your mom will take you, um, which is often what happens um, The when the when the police or the community-based agency or the school calls the hotline, they will often be told, sorry, um, you know, we, we may do an investigation. And just as was explained, if the investigation shows that from the county's perspective that the child's not, in their view, uh, uh, subject to the jurisdiction of the court, then they may get some referrals um, and be sent home. So at that point, there would be no opportunity for the children's lawyer because we don't have a client yet. Um, and I think that the, I, while it's 100% true that there are some parents who are actively out there looking for their child, and when, when they're contacted by child welfare or the police, they say, thank you, we want to do everything we can to help our child, but I also think the reality is that is not most of the kids we're talking about. That, that's just not, we're, we're not seeing those, those are not the girls we're talking about. Um, so it's very small, yeah. though. And T we, we're here to talk about the majority, which is are the ones who, like, T did not have somebody out searching for them, potentially. I mean, I don't know. Or, or at least Yvonne doesn't have, didn't have anybody out searching for her because she'd been in child welfare since she was nine. So, T, you're going to be well, Keisha. Well, yeah, bit, I'm, yeah, I'm speaking from Keisha's perspective, and I, I can't say... Okay, I just got to say this part because I got to get out. This is where, you know, the strategies that you all use at the nursing centers and big ups to Castle Line because I am a little Castle Line. Um, why it's important for you all to, to have these extra strategies, the screens and all that because me as a... Um, as a, as a young Keisha who walked in to get these things, I, uh, my, I primarily nine times out of ten don't self-identify. And the reason can be for various reasons. And so, for example, I think about uh, a situation in which I could be Keisha, I'm coming in, you know, you've asked me all these questions, and then I disclose, well, I didn't think I was being exploited, but I did you know, because my mom didn't have the resources to give me money for pads, have to go and, you know, exchange sex to get the, the, the financial resources I need. But I didn't understand as a, as a 15, 16 year old kid that that was being exploited. And so that's why I just want to say big ups. And I think it's important for us to have these different strategies when working with me as a young person, because I'm apprehensive sometimes. And I probably don't understand your version of what victimization is or your version of exploitation. So Dr. Mays, we're going to fast forward here a bit, and and uh, uh, and you've made the report about Keisha. Uh, do you hear anything back about that once the report's been made? The CPS report? Uh huh. Uh, not usually, but um, 
what so what we what we've done in our health center we actually have created sort of our own little multidisciplinary team in the health center because school health centers are already working sort of in multidisciplinary fashion where there's a health educator in house in the clinic there's usually a school a mental health provider the school psychologist the school social worker in the clinic um, the medical provider and then sort of our front desk staff and everyone is trained on how to um, support a youth who discloses or is at risk of um, CSEC from their own sort of discipline discipline so we usually have the health educator who works with the provider on that day to really be the advocate so they're they're like the youth advocate um, for sort of walking them through the CPS process following up with CPS on reports um, talking to them about exploitation and what that looks like and um, the fact that we do have a lot of youth who think that they're not being exploited and so by asking sort of this question and in, in just a way about a behavior and not necessarily a definition um, it really opens up um, opens up a form for education that our health educator can really talk to them about that but then also being able to have the, sort of the mental health services for youth who know they're being exploited or youth who are just who are experiencing a lot of trauma around um, the behavior that's happening and so ha and so connecting with our school mental health person who's in the health in the health center on that day so Let's say that, uh, that we're going to leave Keisha's situation ambiguous for a while. Mm -hmm. She comes back to you three months later and lets you know that now she's pregnant, and it's her boyfriend's baby, and he's living, and she's living with uh, her boyfriend and his mother. Now what? That's a sticky situation. <laughs> that makes it really even harder. Um, I usually try and and stay really neutral and pretty open because I want the youth to be open about what's going on. So I will ask them, anyone who's pregnant, who's a teenager, I usually ask them who the father is, if they know who the father is, and then I will ask them about their relationship with the father. I don't normally ask about de definitions. People define things in different ways. Um, so I'll, I usually ask them, so what is your, if they call him their boyfriend, what's your boyfriend like? What's his what is he like? And based on their answers, I can figure out sort of what that relationship is like. Like I'll say, so how, how would you describe your boyfriend? What's, what's his personality like? And um, sometimes they'll say, oh, he's cool. And they may look at the, uh, look at the floor. That's code, right? Yeah, he's cool. And that, that, prob that usually is just like, the relationship is probably not that great. Um, or if they answer, well, he takes care of me. That also is usually probably code for the relationship is probably not that great. Um, what I've noticed, and this is all anecdotal from my own practice, um, oh, he's funny. That usually is a good, re a better relationship or sort of a better connection that they have. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy relationship, but it can be a perceived better connection. Um, and so I, I will ask questions like that. Um, to sort of get at what the relationship is like with the with the with the father. So now you've kind of got a relationship with her. Where, where are you going to go with this? Where, where I mean, there's, this is a, this is a sticky situation. She's and she's pregnant. And she's pregnant. So I so again, we have to. I do have to ask around about the age. So if I especially if I am um, concerned, that this is an 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 older man that she's pregnant by. Uh, because again, this is, again, it's an, another reportable thing. So we have talked about confidentiality at the beginning of the visit. Um, it, most of the time, unfortunately, youth who are being exploited have had CPS reports and they have multiple floating CPS reports. I have not found that our youth are afraid of a CPS report because their CPS, CPS reports have happened. Um, and so I haven't found that it's a barrier to um, accessing information. I've also found that youth disclose um, very cryptically. They disclose what they want to disclose when they're ready to disclose. Um, you can't force someone to give a, a, a person's name if they don't want to. And I think that, um, unfortunately, a lot of youth that I've come in contact with have had um, a lot of contact with CPS and know what to disclose and what not to disclose to have a viable um, report so T if you're Keisha when would you disclose what 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 would be the thing that would that would kick it for you where you'd say I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to dr. Mays about this well I think that it comes down to um, 
first of all, I think that's something that we had like a little side conversation over here is that I think uh, I would have to build a relationship with her again. Yeah, it would be about trust building. It would be about, you know, communication. It would be about um, what she's extending to me, things like that. But also um, the conversation, the way it goes, it's very important. Like she said, the, the cryptic, you know, using the certain semantics, using other words, strength-based words over others. That's very important when talking to me because I pay attention to all that. Um, and then uh, I definitely would say in the first, you know, the first, like, 20 minutes, don't ask me how old he is. You'd have to, like, negate around that question. You'd have to ask more identifiable things. Because I'm not going to tell you if I know he's 30 and I'm 15, 16, and I know what's about to happen. So, um, yeah. So so it would, it would have to do with the trust that you've built in... In Dr. Mays, mm -hmm. and the quality of the conversation such that you don't feel like you're being blamed, you don't feel like you're being set up, you don't feel like you're walking into a trap. Yeah, that and like also again going back to like what's the purpose, the, the overall outcome is like within this and you finding her finding out her information about me, like how is this going to actually positively or negatively affect me? Yeah. Does, uh, does being pregnant have any impact on that for you? Definitely, because now, you know, I'm considering I have a child. And so I have to take in that reality. But I also understand that although that these people want to help me, these people aren't the ones that are going to make sure that I have food to, to eat at 1 o'clock in the morning. They're not the people that are going to make sure that I got slippers to walk around my house. So understanding that um, there's some apprehension. I want to build trust, but, it, you know, I can't even call her on her cell phone type thing. So just understanding that. Yeah. So let's let's leave you for a bit. Let's leave uh, Keisha for a bit, okay? And let's go back to Yvonne. Okay, to, to, to you know, spin around three times and, and be somebody else. Um, now, Yvonne's at Mingus Mountain now, right? And she's been there for several months. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, at this point... Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, the, the transition and aftercare plan for her? Michelle, would you be the person to do that, or would it be? Who would be the person that would be talking about that with her? Court would be. Jennifer, yeah. Yeah. Um, our girls' court would be uh, looking at the after plan uh, on, this, on this case. So about three months or so before um, Yvonne comes back, we'd be looking at, okay, what's the situation in terms of her school? What's the situation in terms of her family? Has her family engaged? Uh, because we do have opportunities for families to go and visit uh, the kids at the placement. That's one of the things that the placement's required to do. So they will fly them there. They'll put them up in a hotel. They'll give them an opportunity to have uh, therapy sessions with the therapist who's working with the kid there. Uh, but we have had situations where we've had people or parents go to, fly to the location, and then never show up at the placement. You know, they just, they take off, do whatever. Uh, so we, w we would be looking at the school piece, we would be looking at the services in terms of, you know, West Coast services, we'd be looking in terms of, you know, having uh, all of those, you know, it's not rocket science, all those, all of those important things for a teenager that you need to have in place um, in terms of support, family, school, all of those types of things, and trying to anticipate the problems before the girl gets home so that we can have as, as smooth a transition as possible. Now, if we find out that the young lady, that the situation in, in her home, she has, we, we terminated the dependency on this case, and we made her a 602, we made her a delinquent, a, a 602, so that's, she's probation now. But if we know that the situation at home is still such that she would be at risk if she's in her parents' home, then we need to be talking with social services right now so that we can get the petition so that she has the support of social services when she gets back, so that she's not right back in the same home without support. So um, fortunately, there is a new code section which allows us to do that um, automatically, 607.2 of the Welfare and Institutions Code, which allows us if the child was previously a dependent and uh, we made them a delinquent, but this, the situation has not changed, you know, when they come back from placement and they've completed all their terms and conditions of, of probation. So we'll have a girl who's done an incredible, you know, a great program. 
She's, you know, graduated from high school. Many of them do. She's having real thoughts about whether or not she even wants to come back to Oakland because she is afraid of the triggers. And so, you know, we're really trying to set things up for her to make that transition as smooth as possible. We're also, because of, you know, AB 12 and the services after, um, that are available to kids after they reach 18, if she's graduated from high school and if she wants to stay in Arizona, and we've had some kids who have jobs there, they're going to, you know, junior college there, and they want to stay, we try to put all of that together. So it takes some time and coordination uh, with the agencies, with probation, with social services, and also the court and our knowledge, you know, all the information that we have from Safety Net, all the information that we have from Girls Court, uh, from, you know, having consistent contact with this girl, um, we can kind of put together a plan, hopefully. Now, sometimes it falls apart, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. So you've just got to, you know, take those steps to make sure that you can do everything that you can to, um, to try and put together a plan that is going to work for the young lady when she comes back. Leslie, you want to, uh, what about uh, from your perspective? Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, in the counties where there is dual jurisdiction, um, that depending, in some counties we have a lead agency model, so the youth, Yvonne would have an open case in child welfare and probation, but there would be a lead agency. And either way, if she's considered to be in a foster care placement, um, which Mingus Mountain would be, then her transitional independent living plan should be addressing her aftercare and her goals and all of that starting at the time that she's 14 to 16, depending how well the county is implementing the transitional independent living plan. So the idea that we're going to start looking at transition three months before, which is great, it really is supposed to be an ongoing process. Um, from the moment that she's old enough and Yvonne is old enough to have a TILP that looks at everything in terms of goals and transitions. So that's, to me, another example of where we're perhaps falling down a little bit because either agency should be, always should be thinking about what's next. Um, and was glad that there was the comment about 607.2, which would allow her to have her dependency case automatically reopened, but even for youth who were not current or former dependents, 241.1 has always allowed, um, well before 607.2 and well before AB 12 was passed, has always allowed for a process where the court is supposed to determine which system would better serve the child, and that can happen at the end of a delinquency case, at the beginning of a delinquency case, at any time. And so it just draws it. So what we would be doing as the advocate is we would be at the delinquency court or the dependency court fighting for Yvonne to receive services on the child welfare side as soon as the terms of her probation have been completed and it was felt that she was no longer a risk to the community. Uh, because that's really the only reason she should stay on the probation side is because she presents some risk or hasn't completed her rehabilitation goals but could be served on the child welfare side for many years after that without the, um, despite the good services, the negative stigma of having an open delinquency. So, Justice Bridge, you've talked about your interdisciplinary teams and so on, but you also are, there's, there's also programs that are available to these young women in Seattle or to these young people in Seattle that may not be available here as an option to some of the things we've talked about regarding uh, Yvonne. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, clearly not enough, but the, um, the, the, the gold star would go to a program called Bridge, and uh, it's available either for kids who come in uh, through the juvenile justice system, through the um, child welfare system, or frankly, from a community service agency or from a doc. Um, a lot of this, um, the conversation we've been having about uh, do you report, you have to report, you have mandatory reporter, et cetera, but a lot of placements, a lot of uh, the community advocate doing an MDT, for example, that can happen outside of the court and without court order, provided everybody is in agreement and, of course, the, the child is willing to go. Um, and it does happen. It, uh, kids who have come in on the truancy calendar or an at-risk youth calendar um, end up at the bridge. So um, the bridge is available. It's a residential program. Uh, it's intended for nine months, but kids can, can go for as long as a year. They can be there longer potentially, but it's not old enough for us to test that out quite. Um, it is safe and secure. Uh, there's wraparound services provided. And the community advocate, if there's been a community advocate that has developed a relationship,
relationship uh, from the beginning. The community advocate is continuing to have that, that contact with this child. If she runs from the bridge but she uh, doesn't want to contact somebody from the bridge, she will always have the community advocate that can do and bridge will take her back. So it's that, that, um, that consistency, someone who has the strongest relationship with this child, and then the bridge coordinating with that, whether that be for a transition plan or for the plan for what's going to happen with the services once, once the child is in the bridge. We're going to stop now. Um, and we're going to give our esteemed panelists a chance to breathe and, and get some more coffee, and you too as well.